Good morning, everyone. We've got loads of visitors here with us. We want you to feel welcome here. We're glad that you're here. Um, I hope we get a chance to talk and get to know each other after services a little bit. We are a group of redeemed sinners, people who have um, fallen away from God through rebellion and through bad choices, but through the gospel, he's brought us back to himself because of his redeeming and powerful mercy and his forgiveness. And so we're gathered here today for a very special purpose. We're not just doing this because this is what we've always done. We're doing this because this is our way of saying thank you to God and exalting him um, for what he's done for us. Jesus has died as a sacrifice for our sins. He was raised from the dead, and that changes everything. That gives us hope for a better life to come that we talked about last week in, uh, from 1 Peter in chapter 1. And we're looking forward to that hope, and we want to continue to remind each other of the good things that we have ahead uh, for, for us who follow Jesus, who have faith in him. But um, we're not there yet, and so we're kind of works in progress. But God can continue through the power of his word and through the power of even singing these songs and worshiping him to actually transform us from the inside out. He starts at the heart and he can really change our lives. And you've seen it happen in your life and, uh, and it's encouraging when you see it happen in other people's lives. I've rather cheekily titled this lesson, Speech Therapy and anger management. I hope you see why in a moment here. We thrive as human beings when we have healthy human relationships. We're built for relationships. And when our relationships are good and there's joy and there's love and there's an even exchange and there's good communication, then, then we thrive as human beings. We, we do well, right? And when we lose relationships, or when we don't have any meaningful human relationships, you see what happens to us. We become almost less human. We, we shrivel, we become isolated, we get, we get lonely. And God, through His Word, has a great deal of wisdom to help us in those personal relationships. William Menninger conducted a study where he said the reason that people get fired from their jobs 80% of the time, it's not technical incompetence, but it's relational. It's emotional incompetence. They're hard for others to work with. James Lynch, another uh, one who does these studies, proved that lonely, isolated people live shorter lives. Yes, God's built us to have healthy human relationships. And he's given us wisdom in his word that'll go a long way to eliminate loneliness, not just to eliminate that sense of isolation and loneliness, but to make us thrive, to encourage us, to strengthen us as human beings who are made in his image. Go to the book of James. James gives us three very simple, easy to memorize commands that apply for us as children of God, but apply across the board. Even if you're here and you're not a Christian, I hope that you learn something today, and I hope that it will pique your interest in the resurrected Jesus. James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 will be our text for the sermon. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Pretty easy to memorize. One quick, two slows. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. I think everybody can appreciate that. And I think everybody knows that that's just true. There's, we've all been through times where we wish that we would have closed our mouths. Things would have gone a whole lot better if we just kept our mouths shut. We wish that there was a button, that there was an app for that, right? We could just say, no, I've gone too far. Can I reverse? Proverbs 17, is, the book of Proverbs is filled with wisdom about communication. Some of the best verses uh, are, are these two here. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge. 
And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. I love this one. Even a fool, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. I think in the age of social media and just blasting out, you know, these messages across the internet, uh, we could do well to be reading the book of Proverbs as we do that and applying that wisdom. We've all been guilty of speaking too quickly. We've all walked away from conversation just being like, ugh, I've been insensitive. What I said was inappropriate. Did I come off as egotistical? Was that too judgmental? Have I been gossipy? We've all done that. We walk away and we regret it. But have you ever walked away from a conversation and regretted listening too quickly? Listening too carefully? Oh, I wish I hadn't really dialed in on that conversation. I, I wish that I wasn't really looking that person in the eyes and really showing them that I'm concerned about what they have to say. I wish I hadn't shown that kind of respect and that love to that person. No! Of course not. That's God's wisdom here. Very plain, very practical. And it's yours in Jesus, and you can do with it. And it would, it would, it would change your life. It'll change your relationships. Three things. Be slow to speak, first of all. Be slow to speak. Now, that doesn't mean that quiet people and introverts are necessarily more wise than extroverts and people that, that, that speak more or that are loud. I think you can communicate a great deal of immaturity and foolishness without ever even opening your mouth. Now, it's not saying that quiet people are more wise, but he's saying that sometimes when we use a lot of words, a lot of people will lack self-awareness. It's easy, it's so easy to dominate a conversation and the thing about it is, the paradox is, when you're that person, you're always the last one in the, the room that realizes that you're doing it. Which is the whole problem in the first place, right? Let me give you some pointers, signs you might be speaking too much. Your listener's eyes begin to glaze over into a dull, vacant, unfocused stare. Pay attention to how people are listening to you. You're, you physically restrain people from walking away while you're speaking. Here's a cheap shot for you. You're talking right now instead of listening. How about that? What if we, let's, let's use a metaphor here. What if we drove our cars, which weigh 4,000 pounds, 5,000 pounds, if we drove our cars in traffic like we spoke in conversations, are you aware of your surroundings when you're in your car? You, you better be, right? Do you obey the traffic signals? Are you paying attention to where the other cars are on the road? Are you paying attention to the flow of traffic? Who's behind? Who's to the left, to the right? Who's ahead? What's coming up around the bend, right? Do you speak in a conversation the same way that you drive? Or in a conversation, do you just plow through the intersection? Do you just cross three lanes of traffic without even indicating on your blinker? I think some of us, when we're in conversations, it would do us a whole lot of good to see a stop sign there in the conversation and ask, when was the last time I heard someone else's voice besides my own? There are chronic interrupters in marriages. There are spouses who haven't known the joy of finishing a sentence in years. Interrupters interrupt because they haven't mastered the skill of listening. And instead, and I know that you've seen this, while the other person is talking, they're not listening. They're waiting for you to stop so that they can interject and give their little anecdote. They can interject and they can, uh, you know, use that time for them to speak. And this is detrimental to relationships. We're not, just, we're not just being silly here. This is actually, you know, you don't want to be in the room with this person. And, and if you don't want to be in the room with that person, then, then they're going to become lonely. No, they're not, no one's going to want to hang out with them, right? It's, it's poison for relationships. Proverbs 
10 and verse 19. When words are many, transgression is not lacking. There's more chance of messing up the more words you use. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. When I was growing up, there was these infomercials. Do you remember the lifeline where like the people would fall out? I've fallen and I can't get up. We need one of those for our mouths. I'm talking and I can't shut up. We need to use Proverbs as a filter to use God's wisdom. And if you're a chronic interrupter, if you're somebody who you recognize or maybe other people have told you in the past, you know it would be good for you to be a little slower to speak, ask yourself some penetrating questions. Be uncomfortable with yourself for a moment. Why is it that you speak too much? Is it about some kind of insecurity? Are you anxious? Do you want to control the situation? Is it a pride thing? Frederick Buchner wrote a novel in the 80s called Godric, um, and one of the characters in that story is described like this. Words came spilling out of him. He didn't even care what he talked about. He'd rattle on until the spittle gathered around his mouth, and if you made a move to leave, there'd come to his eyes a haunted look, and he'd talk all the faster to try to force you to stay. Words were the line that moored him to the world, I think, and he thought if ever the line should break, he'd be forever cast adrift. You know someone like that in your life. Maybe that's, maybe that's you. Living in fear of loneliness, and your defense is to talk and talk and talk. The more afraid, the more you talk. The more you talk, the more others avoid you. The more others avoid you, the lonelier, lonelier you become. The lonelier you become, the more you want to talk to people. I think a lot of people live in that cycle. But practicing God's wisdom in this regard, being slow to speak, it's not simply about healing relationships. It's about healing yourself, too. It's about dealing with who you are and why you do the things that you do, and why you speak the way that you speak. Do these principles apply to Instagram and social media? Absolutely, right? Yes, they do. Be slow to type. Be slow to post. Be slow to speak. Because what comes out of your mouth proceeds from your heart. You are giving away who you are by how you communicate to other people. You need to put a filter. Is it true what I'm going to say? Is it helpful? Is it encouraging? Right? Is it loving? Is it worth saying? Let your speech be always gracious, Paul says, seasoned with salt. Some of us are taking those words out of the oven way too quick. We need to be seasoning them. Roll those things over in our minds. The reason why this is important is because Jesus says we're going to be judged by every careless word that comes out of our mouth. So it's important. Slow down. Be slow to speak. Be slow to speak. Easy to remember, right? Second of all, be quick to listen. This is a difficult command. This is one of the hardest things you'll do all day is to listen. And the reason why it's so difficult is because active listening is an act of humility. It's an act of service. It's an act of humbling yourself. When you listen, you're laying aside yourself. You're laying aside your agenda, your pride, your knowledge. And when we listen, we're behaving like God. Is anybody a greater listener than God? Great messianic uh, point and uh, later on in, in the uh, book of Isaiah, God says that in this time when the Messiah comes, before they call, I will answer. He'll know what our needs are even before we ask him. While they are yet speaking, I will hear them. How many prayers does God hear every single day, every single minute? He hears every single one, though. Every cry, every longing of the human heart, every single word God is listening to. Comparatively, God listens way more than he speaks. This is it right here. These are the words of God. Comparatively, he listens way more, way more than he speaks. And when he speaks, 
Every single word matters, which is why Israel in the earliest days, the infancy of the nation, are called to listen, to listen. This is a prayer that Israelites would, would recite every day, and it was called the Shema. And the Shema, that's the Hebrew word for hear or listen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Israel was to orient their lives around paying attention to God, humbling their, their, themselves in the act of, of listening, with understanding, with self-examination, with awareness, and with obedience. Listen, O Israel. Jesus had an amazing capacity to teach by listening to other people. His listening skills are what allowed him to respond in profound ways to people. A man came up to him, a, a rich young ruler, and he asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus repeats some of the commandments of the law, and he says, these things I have done from my youth up until now. And there's this beautiful passage, just a little snippet of a passage, really. It's not the entire thing. And Jesus looks at this guy, and he loves him. He loves him. He hears what he says, and he looks at him. And he pauses in the conversation before he, before he responds. I wonder if that look stayed with that man. This story doesn't end well. The man walks away. He walks away, not doing what the Lord told him to do. Jesus would prompt other people to talk. And we all know when we talk, we're revealing our hearts. And he would do this by asking penetrating questions. What do you want? Who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? On the road to Emmaus, what were you guys talking about? Why do you call me Lord? Do you want to be made well? Why do you call me good? Why do you doubt? Do you love me? And he would sit back and listen to the answers to those questions. Somebody, uh, somebody counted all the questions that Jesus asked, and I don't know if this is true or not, but they said 307 questions in the New Testament Jesus asked. And most of the time, he wouldn't give the answer, which is frustrating. But he did that for a purpose because the questioner would answer the question himself. It was a way of teaching. Sometimes a good question is more helpful than the right answer because we grow a lot when we wrestle with verbalizing and answering that question, right? Just think how patient Jesus is. You know how it is when you know something and you're talking to somebody who thinks they know what they're talking about? You know how much patience it takes to not butt in? Maybe you're doing that right now. I bet you I can give a better sermon on listening and talking. <laughs> but you know how frustrating that is. Jesus knew everything. He knew everything. He could, he could walk circles, talk circles around the, the greatest teachers of the day, and yet how much time does he take just listening? He's the man with all the answers, but instead he patiently waited for people to come to the right conclusion, and it's because he loved others. Knowledge makes you arrogant, but love builds up, Paul says to the Corinthians. Be quick to listen. Be quick to listen. Ask questions and really listen to the answer. Look people in the eye and give them that courtesy. Show them that respect. Show them that love. Show them that you're interested in who they are. You don't have to respond with an anecdote. You don't have to respond with a one-up story. Well, you said this. Well, I did this. You don't have to do that. Sometimes you just listen and you take it in and you show that love to that person. Be slow to anger. Be slow to anger. Now, he doesn't say here, never be angry. He says, be slow to reach that point of anger. He's talking about having a temper that is long, being long-suffering, having a long fuse. Anger is not bad in and of itself. Anger is a God-given emotion. God can sometimes be angry in his self-disclosure to Moses in Exodus 34. The Lord, the Lord, God is the one speaking here, a God merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Anger is an important emotion, but it's a volatile emotion. It's an explosive, destructive emotion. It's like a fire that consumes all that is around it. God gets angry, 
But when he does, he's always slow to get there, and he's angry for the right reasons and in the right way. Can you say that about yourself? Not always. Anger is the emotion behind justice. God's anger against injustice and wickedness, that is righteous anger. Jesus was angry on occasion. But the anger of man does not produce the justice or the righteousness of God. Most of the time, when we examine our anger, it's not about righteousness. It's not about justice. It's about personal revenge. Even Christians deal with this. We deal with this. Later on in the book of James, James talks about this kind of anger bubbling up in quarrels. What causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and don't have? And what does he say? You murder. He's talking to Christians there. And we see human anger playing out in the world. We see how it ends. Often in... in loud outbursts and slammed doors and broken belongings and destructive behaviors and sometimes even violence and sometimes even murder. But it manifests itself first in your speech, doesn't it? Jesus says, you've heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. That's true. That's what the old law said. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever, well, look where it leads, insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, that's like you good for nothing, nobody, you'll be liable to the hell fire. We see videos uh, on social media being posted. There's always somebody with a phone around when you get angry in public and you will lose your job for it. Sometimes people in high positions sometimes will have to deal with the consequences of their anger over political, uh, you know, wranglings, over religious even things, people saying that they're God's people and they'll get angry and get violent. People over betrayal and in marriages, they go crazy, they say and do things in a moment of anger that they regret later. What if we had a video of just the thoughts in our minds, of all the times that we were angry, of all the times that we exploded. It'd be a shameful thing. Now, we don't have that, but the point is that God can see what's happening in the human heart. When we're hurt by somebody, what do we do? What's our natural reaction? We want to we wanna deal with our pain by reflecting it back on the person who hurt me. Because when we're hurt, we want the one that hurt us to feel that pain. Hurt people hurt people. And our human anger is often about revenge. It's not about justice. It's not about righteousness. But God's anger, in the end, is about reconciliation. And it's about healing relationships. But human anger, it begets anger. And we create a cycle of more pain, more broken relationships. And relationships are never healed. And they just grow more and more distant. What is the only thing that can break that kind of anger. It's love and mercy, isn't it? A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I think this ultimately finds us at the foot of the cross, this idea of anger. God's solution for our anger and the violence and the murder that comes out of it is found in the cross, where His love for us and His justice his righteous anger against sin and violence and wickedness, that's where they come together. They come together in the body of Jesus on the cross. God's righteous anger towards sin and His love towards me as a sinner, they meet in His body and it destroys Him. That's how powerful human sin is. That God's righteous, it's not God's um, revenge, it's His reconciliation. He's healing broken relationships through the cross, which is why Paul could say, in Christ, God Himself was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their sins, their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us a message of reconciliation, of bringing people together through the body of Jesus, saying that your sins, your, your unrighteous anger has been dealt with in Jesus. So the cross is the pattern for how we deal with our anger. If we're vengeful, if we explode, if we hurt other people's, people, look to the cross. 
Maybe you're not like that. Maybe you're somebody that's uh, more like me. You pout. You, you become passive aggressive. You withdraw. Look to the cross. Look to the cross. This is what Paul does. Repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Don't do it. He says, leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Would you steal from God? Vengeance belongs to Him because He's always angry for the right reasons in the right way. But we are not always angry for the right reasons in the right way. Leave it to God. This is what we need to be concerned with. If your enemy is hungry, go and feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Not to, not to punish this man, man. No, the ultimate aim is to reconcile him to God through love, through the cross. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Be quick to hear, be slow to speak, be slow to anger. There's one more point I think we should make from this text that we may have missed in James chapter 1. One subversive word there. I wonder if we picked up on it. Social scientists that study human behavior, they have proven that the more powerful a person is, the more they speak and the more they interrupt others. Winston Churchill famously at a dinner party with his son was, was uh, speaking and giving a story, and Winston Churchill just interrupted him. And then his son tried to break back in and reclaim the story, and he says, don't interrupt me when I'm interrupting you. CEOs, politicians, wealthy, the experts, they use more words because they feel like they're worth listening to. This is something I have to struggle with as a preacher, too. Sometimes a longer sermon is not a better sermon. The difference between a captive audience and a hostage situation is about 10 minutes in a sermon. But it was a lot worse in the ancient world. There was a saying in the ancient world, as is the speech, so is the life. In other words, the more important you are, the more words you're allowed to use in society. Do you see the subversive phrase? Every person. Does it matter where you work? No matter what you look like? No matter what kind of clothes you wear? Does it matter how wealthy you are? What zip code you live in? In Rome, the rule was you let the slave be slow to speak. You let the poor be slow to speak. You let the woman be slow to speak. You let the rich, the powerful, you let them use words to enhance their status and exalt themselves. And James says, that's not the way the family of Jesus works at all. In fact, when Jesus was accused wrongfully by the chief priests and the elders, he didn't even open his mouth. He gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even a sing single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Why was Jesus silent like a sheep led to the slaughter? He's identifying with those who have no voice in the Roman world, with the poor, with the slave, with the orphan, with the widow, whose voice is minuscule, the marginalized, all those who are trampled on and left out. Though he was rich, he became poor for our sake. Though he was in the form of God, became a human servant, obedient to God, obedient even to the point of death, even a death on a cross. And in the new family that Jesus created through his death and through his resurrection, the rich Roman aristocrat would sit at the feet of a Galilean fisherman and hear the truth of God and the wisdom of God. He would humble himself. Let the lowly brother, are you lowly? Do you have low roots? Exalt, boast in your exaltation. Are you rich? You may be. Are you educated? You come from an esteemed family? Boast in your humiliation. 
because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. It all equals out at the foot of the cross. We all need God's help taming our tongue, dealing with our anger, and humbling ourselves before others. Jesus is the one who led by example, who teaches us how to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And to quote one more passage from James at the end of our discussion, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. We always leave time at the end of a sermon to sing a, a song of worship to God but worship is funny in that it's not just directed toward God, but it's directed toward one another. And this is also a time of reflection where you need to hold your life and really examine yourself. And if you need to make things right in your life, then do it now while we sing this song. If you need to become a Christian today and you don't know how to do that, you've never th thought about that, what does that mean? You want to make a confession that Jesus is the Son of God and you want to devote your life to Him, then just come forward and sit on this front pew as we stand and we sing this song.